So, we're going to be talking about a Rambam that is in the laws of kings, which is going to relate to this week's Parsha, which talks about Avraham giving Miser 10%. Excuse me, it was called the tithe. Here's the Rambam. I'm sorry? Question? No, if everybody could mute yourselves, please, that would be helpful. And then if you have a question, you can unmute yourself. Some people don't know how to do that. You might have to mute people or mute me at all. Do you have that access? I should have that access. Yes, I just don't know how to. Let me oh, see. But you know how to tell them to do it? No. I know how to tell them to do it, yes. Yes, tell them. Yeah. Oh, mute all. I see it. I see it. I see yeah. mute all. Hey, we, can unmute, we can unmute if we have a question. That's all you need is mute all. We should have mute to all. unmute I have ourselves. To, I have to take this call one second, please. Hello? In the center, the one in the center. Yep. 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 Thanks, bye. Oh, okay, also, sorry. Rabbi, you I'm can sorry? Mute yourself, you can mute yourself if you're speaking to somebody as well. Oh, okay. that's a good idea, too. <laughs> All there. right. Okay. Allow participants to mute themselves. Yes, here we go. Okay, so the Rambam says, Al Shisha Dvorim Nitztava Adamarishan. Odomarishan was commanded on six matters. I want to make this, there we are. Al Avoida Zara, about not serving idols. Al Birka Sashem against blasphemy. Al Shvichas Damim, not to murder. Al Gilu Arroyas, about sexual immorality. Al Agezal, but not stealing. Va'al Hadinim and about arranging courts of justice. Afapi Shekulon Hen Kabola Biodeno Moshe Abeno, even though we have a tradition about all of these from Moshe, the Hadas Noitelehen and they are logical. Mechal Divritur Yerushal Elunitstava. We can understand from the words of the Torah that he was specifically commanded on these six. Now he doesn't bring the verses how we know it, but the Gemara and Sanhedrin discusses which verses we learn all of these mitzvahs from. He added the prohibition against eating a limb of a living animal. As the verse says, However, you shall not eat the flesh of an animal while it's still alive. I'm translating that loosely. Nimtsu Sheva Mitzvah, so we have seven mitzvahs. These are what are called the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noach, the seven mitzvahs that relate to all the sons of Noach, i.e. all of mankind. By the way, as an aside, why was Adam Arisha not commanded to not eat a limb of a living animal? You can unmute yourselves if you have the answer. Or you can type it in, whatever you prefer. This is not a rhetorical question. Yes, Susan, go ahead. I don't have the answer. Uh, this is a Noahide. Is that what you're talking about? Exactly. These are the seven Noahide laws. Okay. I'm sorry. to. I, I don't have an answer to your question. I'm sorry. I just Anybody didn't know what I got Caesar Levy on the beach here. Maybe you have an answer. Who else? No? Dr. J, what do you say? Where's Isaac uh, Yaroslavich? I thought I admitted you in. Huh. Is it because we're not allowed to eat anything with blood in it? And life animal definitely has it. Um, well, the Pasuk does speak about with its blood, not eating it with its blood. But that's actually a, a thing that is specific to the Jewish people. 
the uh, laws against uh, eating the limb of a living animal applies to Noahides, but the laws against eating blood is only for the Jewish people. Okay. So the idea is... The limb can't, can't be kosher. If it's alive, it's not kosher. Well, that's if you have to keep kosher, but if you're not Jewish, you don't have to keep kosher. Meaning to say, you're right. If a, if, a, if a person rips a limb off a living animal, besides the fact that it's the limb of a living animal, which is problematic, it also was not slaughtered. Correct. It's therefore, not, it's not, not kosher correct. for not two correct. reasons. That is correct. But here we're talking about the Noahide laws. The Noahides do not have to slaughter their animals. They can kill them in whatever way they want, hopefully a humane method, but they don't have to slaughter it. Nevertheless, if it's a limb, of, a limb of a living animal, they cannot eat it. So the answer to that question is, even though it's a side point, but it's worth mentioning, that originally mankind was supposed to be vegetarian. For 10 generations, man was supposed to be vegetarian. It was forbidden to kill an animal for the sake of eating its meat. You know what? I take it back. We actually did not have to be vegetarian. We were not allowed to kill an animal for the sake of eating its meat. If the animal died peacefully or even tragically in an accident or whatnot, you were allowed to eat it. You could eat carrion, roadkill, you name it. But you could not actually kill an animal and eat it. So therefore, the laws against um, eating the limb of a living animal were not given yet. However, after Noah saved all of the animals in his ark, Hashem rewarded him and said, listen, you saved all these animals. They only exist here in the world because of you. From now on, I'm giving you permission to eat them. So at that time, he also said, you're not allowed to eat the limb of a living animal. This is the way it continued in the world. Until Avraham Avinu. Ba Avraham v'nistava yeser aleidu b'mila. Avraham was commanded in addition to these seven. So now we're talking about mitzvahs that are specifically the Jewish people. Avraham being the first Jewish person. He was commanded to do a bris mila. Excuse me, let me quiet that phone. One second, please. All right, a lot going on here in the Citroen household today, excuse me. So, the who is Palal Shachris. In addition, Avram also davened Shachris. The Yitzchak, the second of the patriarchs, Yitzchak, Hifrish Meiser. He separated a tenth. That's the concept of a tithe. The tithes in the times of uh, the, the the Torah, when, when I mean the Torah, I mean the times of the Beis HaMikdash, when we were all in Israel, and uh, things were uh, a very agricultural society. The tithes meant that you would take 10% of your field, the produce of your field, and you would give it to the levy. And then there was other percentages given to the Kohen, a certain percentage was given to the poor in certain years, and so on. So Yitzchak was the first person, or at least it seems like, from the wording of the Rambam, he was the first person to separate the tithe. And we're going to see where we find that in the verse soon. He also added another prayer towards the end of the day, which we call what? What do we call that prayer that Yitzchak instituted? Myrav? No. Close. Minka. 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 Minka is correct. He was davening that prayer when his future wife Rivka came back. The Yaakov Hoysef Gidhan Nosha. Yaakov added the precept of not eating the sciatic nerve. That happened when he had the battle with the angel. He was injured, but nevertheless, he was saved. And as a remembrance of that occurrence, Hashem commanded him and his descendants, which are all of us, to not eat the sciatic nerve. And that's why we do not have filet mignon here in America, 
because that comes from the hindquarters. That is the hindquarters. And the sci sciatic nerve is in there somewhere, and it's problematic. The Hispalal Arvis, another thing that he did is that he davened Myrev. Now in Egypt, Amram, who was Moshe Rabbeinu's father, was commanded about extra mitzvahs. The Rambam does not tell us, by the way, what were these extra mitzvahs that Amram got. Until Moshe Rabbeinu came along and the rest of the Torah was given through him. Okay, and there you have the English, which I gave the translation as I was reading it. Okay, so far so good. Everything seems fine. Now, I do want to point out before we continue that even though the Rambam says that these mitzvahs were commanded to and, and done by the patriarchs, and before that by Noah and by Adam, it's important to remember that the reason we keep them is because they were repeated at Sinai. If they had only been given and, and accepted by the earlier generations, but not repeated at Sinai, we would not have to keep them. Because the Sinai revelation was a complete redo of everything that preceded it. Meaning to say, ever, all previous mitzvahs were nullified in terms of the Jewish people. And this is the new covenant. That only happened once, by the way, that this Torah is going to stay with us forever. It's not going to be changed and whatever. But when it was given, it replaced any previous mitzvahs. But nevertheless, these mitzvahs were repeated again after the Torah was given. And therefore, we still have them today. The sixth given to Adam Marishan, the seventh given to Noah. Altogether, we call those the seven Noahide laws. And then, of course, the mitzvah of bris mila we still do today, like Avram did. We still give 10% as a tithe today. Now, if you're a farmer in Israel, in theory, you would give a tithe to the levy. In practice, they do not. I guess it's not so easy to identify who the Leviim are today. Anyway, the Leviim in ancient times didn't really have work the way everybody else did. They didn't have much land, and they were busy in the Beis Migdash, so they had to be supported. So that 10% was supporting them. Nowadays, a levy can work like everybody else. So it's kind of not really practice so much the mitzvah of tithing. I mean, you have to tithe it. They do set it aside, but they don't actually give it to the levy. And of course, it is now replaced with the custom, some say it's actually a rabbinic law, to give 10% of one's income to the poor. And that is kind of the mitzvah of tzedakah, a mitzvah to give tzedakah to the poor, but the idea of giving 10% is that we have to give a certain amount of tzedakah according to this uh, halacha, according to this law, and that is at the very least 10% of one's income, so that's how we still fulfill this concept today. And of course, we still do not eat the sciatic nerve, and we dive in shachas minchamayim, just like they did, and so on. Okay, so this leads me, or leads us, to the Ravid's question on the Rambam. The Ravid says, I don't have it in English, so I'm just going to read it in the Hebrew if you have the notes. Number two, the Ravid says, Avraham Oimer, Avraham says, the Ravid, by the way, was Rabbi Avraham ben David. He was much older than the Rambam. And he took it upon himself to dispute the Rambam on any occasion that he could. Some say that he did it because he did not want people to think that the Rambam was the only book in Torah that they had to study. The Rambam writes in his introduction that if you learn the written Torah and then you learn my book, you've covered it all. Because my book, he says, includes the entire oral Torah in it. So you have the written Torah, you have the oral Torah, you're good to go. The Ravid was not happy with that approach. And he wanted people to continue studying other sources, including the Gemara, and the other opinions about how to interpret the Gemara. And therefore, he took every occasion that he could to argue on the Rambam, because he wanted to show, eh, the Rambam is not the only opinion, you know. 
There are other opinions in halacha, and therefore you better keep on learning and don't think you can just learn Rambam and nothing else. In any case, the Ravid says, Avram Oimer, I say, his name was Avram. Kain Hoyeroi Loimer Vahu his palo shachris vihifrish miser. The Rambam should have said that Avram Davin Shachris and he also separated a tithe. Avram also separated a tithe. Why does the Rambam skip out on Avram's tithing and ascribe the mitzvah of tithing only to Yitzchak when Avram did just the same? So what we're going to do now is we're going to look into the verses in the Chumash where we see both the tithing of Avram and the tithing of Yitzchak. Let's start with the verse about Yitzchak. Number three in the notes, Genesis 26, 19. This is in the Torah portion of Toldos. Vayizra Yitzchak ba'aretz ahi la'yimtza ba'shana ahi me'a sha'orim vayivarcheyu Hashem. The context of this verse is as follows. Yitzchak had left the Holy Land, or at least he had left the regular part of the Holy Land where he was living earlier because there was a famine, and he went to the land of the Philistines. Technically, it was still within the borders of the Holy Land. So he left where he had been living, and he moved to the area occupied by the Philistines. And he got into a bit of a back and forth with the king of the Philistines. He said his wife was his sister. The king abducted her. Turned out that it was his wife. The king said, you can stay in my territory. And he did, at first at least. And even though it was a year of famine, it says that Yitzchak planted and found 100-fold, 100 times what he was expecting to find. Vayvorcheyu Hashem, and Hashem blessed him. Now, Rashi says, and this is quoted, this is a quote from the Medrash. A rabbi said that the estimate was made for the purpose of the tithe. Why did Yitzchak estimate his, his uh, income? What was the point of it? To estimate it and then to know that he had a hundred times what he actually was planning to make. The whole point of it was to separate the tithe. So he already fulfilled the idea of giving 10% to the levy. Now, who was the levy in those days? Who was the coin in those days? That is a good question. We're going to see in the next source that Avram had a coin that he gave his tithe to, and that was none other than Malki Tzedek, who was the king of Yerushalayim. His other name was Shem, the son of Noach. So that's in the case of Avraham. Who did Yitzchak give it to? I'm not sure. But nevertheless, he gave 10%. Okay, now the Hassam Soifer asks the following question. The Hassam Soifer was Reb Moshe, I forget his name. I forget his last name, Schreiber, I think it's Schreiber, or Moshe Schreiber, who uh, lived in Pressburg. He had a famous yeshiva. And most of the Hungarian rabbanim were students of his or students of their students and so on and so forth. Great, great Torah scholar in, in all aspects of the Torah. So he discusses this Rashi. The Rashi says that this estimate was made for the purpose of the tithe. And he wonders why it says that it was an estimate when in fact you are not supposed to give um, that you are not supposed to give um, a tithe by an estimate. A tithe is supposed to be given with exactly 10%. You're supposed to know how much your grain is. 
and give exactly 10% of that. Not more and not less. Now we understand why you cannot give less, because if you're supposed to give 10% and you're giving less, you're not fulfilling the mitzvah. That goes without saying. But why can you not give more than 10%? I'll open it up for answers. I can't talk for an hour straight, it's too much. I need some class participation here. Why, why do you think that it's not acceptable to give more than 10% for the tithe? You couldn't know in advance what your crops would be like. Well, that's true. But even when you know approximately how much your crops are, you can't guess and give 10% approximately. You have to measure it and give exactly 10%. Why is that? I think if people get into the habit of estimating they may um, become lax in the application of the mitzvah. That's no. a good answer. And actually, that is brought in reference to the tithe that we give today. You're supposed to give 10% minimum of your income to tzedakah. So in reference to that, it says you're not supposed to give by estimation. You're supposed to know exactly what your income is. And you're supposed to therefore give exactly 10%. Now, we know that you're allowed to give more than 10%. You're even allowed to give up to 20%. It's not recommended to give more than 20% because you might not have enough for yourself and so on. But the idea of knowing exactly how much you're obligated is so that you should not become lax. That's exactly right. If a person could just give approximately so sometimes he might be giving too much, or not too much, but more than he has to. But sometimes he also might end up giving up, giving less than what he has to, because he figures, oh, in the past I gave more, now I'm going to give less, and it's all going to equal out and whatever. And that's not necessarily the case. Yes, Reb Ezra. So aren't, isn't there a, poss a possibility that if, if you end up giving less, then that means that you're holding on to something which doesn't belong to you and you could then be and then it could be very very problematic in the sense of uh in the sense of uh that you're using something that's hectic yes no 100 percent. if you're giving uh less that's certainly problematic the issue is that you should also not give more and uh, Reb David is suggesting because if you give more, you may end up giving less. Yes, Susan. Also, you don't you don't want to be arrogant to show off to give more. That's something else. That's an aspect. And I think Hashem wants the exact measurement. He because the Jewish people need our where where we our numbers. We numbers are very important to us. Amounts are very important to us. Measurements are very important. So I think this carries through the whole, uh, uh, the whole history. Uh, we don't we don't estimate. Even today, we don't estimate. We we know exactly. Uh, at least, I mean, that's been my experience. Let me just put it that way. Uh, numbers are very important, and uh, we need to know what what we have and what we need to have for ourselves and what we need to to give. Uh, as to the poor people, and it's it's something that is very important, extremely important. Um, well, what you said about not showing off and not uh, you know making it appear that you're too you know better than everybody else that that I'll you know that I hear numbers being important. You know, maybe they are, maybe not, depending on in what context. So yeah, sometimes numbers are important. I I, I don't know exactly in this case. Uh why they would be, but yes, sometimes they I'm are. talking about, uh, when I say numbers, I mean, uh, I don't even know how to explain it. We have, we have a, a, another rabbi that teaches us the code of Jewish laws, and it's all about the numbers, exacting, and how important uh, 
the laws are and uh, following them. No, in, in general, uh, yes. you're right. In right. general, you're right. The halacha always has very specific Thank limitations. You. The halacha, the Jewish law, has very specific limitations and numbers and amounts, so that's true in general, yes. So here's the thing about the, the tithe. Because you're only obligated to give 10%, this is specifically to the agricultural tithe from grain, because you're only obligated to give 10%, if you give more than 10%, that extra amount is considered untithed grain. That means the levy is getting grain from which there was no tithe given. So if you're giving him extra as a present, that's nice. You know, so you can you can give 10% as miser and then take another 2%, 5%, 10%, whatever you want. Say, hey, this is my gift to you. Is that you? Getting some feedback from some participants. Mute all. Okay, you're muted again. You can unmute yourself as needed. So, um, if we were to give more than 10% in the first place, then what was given more than the 10% is considered untithed grain. Since it was not, it's, it was, it's neither the tithe itself, which is only 10%, nor was it tithed from because you took it together with the 10%. So that's a technical reason why you can't give more than 10% of the actual grain. In terms of the tithe that we give today from our income, like I said, it is permissible to give more than 10%, but you are supposed to calculate it exactly to know exactly what you're giving so that you don't end up giving less. Okay, so... The Hassan Soifer says as follows. Why is it that he made an estimate if you're supposed to give exactly? And the way he answered is as follows. Mm -hmm. Listen carefully to his interpretation. It's not so essential for the whole class, but it's a nice interpretation. I mean, for the rest of the class. But it's a nice interpretation. He says that Yitzchak wanted his produce to belong to him alone and not to have a partner with the king of the Philistines. Even in those days, the king would demand a tax. So if he would just process his grain and then count it up and then give the tithe, well, that grain doesn't all belong to him. It belongs to the king as well because there's a tax owed on it. So in order to do away with that, he estimated beforehand how much this field was supposed to make and he gave the king the king's share of the tax based on the expected income. And then the king freed him to keep all of the grain. And when he actually... Um, counted the grain after he processed it, he realized that it was a hundred times more than he had expected. When he gave the actual tithe, he didn't give it with estimation. He gave it actually measuring it and weighing it or whatnot. So the, the purpose of the estimate was to take care of the taxes in advance of giving the tithe. And by the way, this is also true today, that when you want to know how to figure out how much to tithe, the tithe is after taxes. It's from your net income, not from your gross income. That's just a side point. Okay, so this is all the source for how we know that Yitzchak gave a tithe. How do we know that Avram gave a tithe as the Rivet says? So that is number four in the notes, Genesis 14, 20. This is a pasuk in this week's parsha. Avram had a battle with four kings. These four kings had defeated the five kings who owned the cities of Sodom and Amorah. And when they did that, they took Avram's nephew Lot as a captive. Avram came to save his nephew. 
and he defeated the four kings. He got all the booty of the battle, which was basically all of the property of those cities, as well as the people. And when he was finished the battle, it says that Malki Tzedek, who was the king of Yerushalayim, and his other name was Shem, the son of Noach, came out to greet him. And he brought him bread and wine, symbolizing that he did not hold it against him, that Avram had defeated the four kings who were his descendants. And on that occasion, it says, He gave him 10%. He gave him the tithe of everything. Now, the verse does actually not say who gave whom the tithe. It just says, and he gave him, and he gave him. So who gave who the tithe? According to Rashi, Avram gave it to Malki Tzedek. Malki Tzedek was like a koyan. He was like a holy man. So he was considered, he considered like a koyan. Like and Avram gave him the tithe. The Ibn Ezra adds, the Adam Roy like Malki Tzedek. There was no better person to give the tithe to than Malki Tzedek, who was a great tzedek, a righteous person. Now, you might wonder, what tithe did he give him? Was this like back taxes that he owed for all of his income up until that point in his life? Like, wh what was he doing until now? So the Ramban explains, the Ramban is not to be confused with the Rambam. The Rambam is of Moshe ben Maimon, uh, who originally was from Spain, ended up in Morocco, Israel, and then in Egypt, which is where he wrote, um, you know, most of his works. And the Ramban was Rab Moshe ben Nachman, who was about 100 years later, also from Spain, and ended up in Israel at the end of his life. And he wrote a commentary on the Torah. And he says that this was a tenth of all of the booty that Avraham had conquered and acquired through the battle. Now, the very next verse says that the king of Sodom said to Avram, give me the people and you can keep the booty. And Avram said, no, no, no. I'm giving you everything. I'm not taking a shoelace from you. I'm not taking even one thread from you. I don't want it to be said that I got wealthy from this stuff, which people could say it's not really his. It belongs to the people of Sodom. The poor people, he took their stuff. No, I don't want that to be said. So I am giving everything back. Well, according to the Ramban, he had already given 10% as miser, as the tithe, because that's not up to him to give back. That's something that is an obligation, because technically he had a right to keep everything. When you conquer something in battle, that becomes your property. He had a right to keep everything. He only gave it away because he wanted to make a sanctification of Hashem's name. And people shouldn't look, uh, look at him funny for taking people's stuff and whatever. But the 10% that he was obligated to give, he gave first. And in fact, the Bechor Shor adds to that. He's another commentary on the Torah. He adds to that, that this 10% that he gave included the people which technically he could have kept them as slaves, and instead he gave them back to the king so that the king could have his cities back. Well, 10% of those people, no, he did give them away to Malki Tzedek as slaves because that was 10% of his, of his uh, battle income. Now, I do want to point out that not all of the commentaries follow this view of the verse. The Chizkuni says, that it was Malki Tzedek who gave the tithe to Avraham. And according to him, this is when the kahuna went over from shame to the Jewish people. Malki Tzedek, who was shame, recognized that Avraham was like the spiritual leader of the generation, the forefather of the Jewish people, and he symbolically bestowed upon him the kahuna by giving him that tithe. So um, that's that's an interesting uh, opinion. 
I wrote out the right, uh, I copied and pasted the Chizkuni uh, here in the Hebrew. Malki Tzedek Lavram Maiser Mikol. Malki Tzedek gave Avram 10%. Malki Tzedek Huavar Menachahun. V'nesana Avram. He finished being a Koyen and he gave it to Avram. Okay. I'm going to skip the rest of it. Rabbi, can I ask you something? Yes. Well, wasn't it, isn't there something important that Abram didn't have any children, he was childless, and he was trying to actually find out from Hashem if that, if he was going to continue childless. Isn't that what this is really all about? That is later on in the Torah portion, yes. That, oh. that comes up later on. Okay, that, sorry. He, um, that he asked Hashem about having children and Hashem uh, promised him that he's going to have a child and then of course that was fulfilled even though he was old but he, he gave himself a bris at the end of this week's Pasha and then in next week's Pasha is when he actually has a baby so that, that is coming up, yes so Another interesting interpretation about this verse is that, in fact, the tithe that Malki Tzedek gave to Avraham was the very 10% that Avraham was, was going to give to Malki Tzedek. Malki Tzedek said, no, you can keep it. And what he meant to intimate was, you know, you want to give stuff away you want to give it back to the king of Sodom because you don't want to make it look like you saved people just to keep their money and whatever. Right. He said, nevertheless, you could still keep 10% just as a, as, you know, payment for your efforts. Don't keep it all, but at least keep 10%. Like a show of faith. Right. Just a, like a, an appreciation gift. So, in fact, Avram didn't listen and he gave everything back. He didn't even give a thread, like we said, or a shoelace. But Malkitzedek was informing him that he had the right to keep the 10%. Okay, so now let's go back to the Rambam's opinion. Again, the Ravid says that Avram was the first one to give the tithe. The Rambam did not say that. The Rambam said, Yitzchak was the first one to give the tithe. Why did the Rambam not count Avraham? So the Kesef Mishnah, which is a commentary on the Rambam written by Rabbi Yosef Karo. Rabbi Yosef Karo is most famous for his Shulchan Aruch, the uh, Code of Jewish Law, which he also authored. But in his commentary on the Rambam, the Kesef Mishnah says, that the reason the Rambam didn't count Avram in the tithes as, given, as having given a tithe is because the tithe that Avram gave was not the 10% that the Torah obligates. The Torah obligates 10% from the grain. The 10% that we give from our income is a later custom and rabbinic law. The Torah law is to give 10% from the grain. Well, Avram's miser, Avram's 10% was not from the grain. Avram's 10% was from his battle income. Yitzchak was the first one who gave 10% of the grain. Avram gave 10% of his booty. So when it comes to finding an example of what the patriarchs did and saying, well, Avram did this mitzvah, Yitzchak did that mitzvah, and so on and so forth, we prefer to speak about the tithe that Yitzchak gave, which is similar to the Torah obligation of tithing the grain, rather than the tithe that Avram gave, which is only like the, the rabbinic mitzvah of tithing income. And it does not relate to the Torah obligation of, tithe, uh, of tithing the grain. Rabbi, can we say that the booty was not his in the beginning, uh, you know, per se. Whereas Yitzhak's uh, tithing comes directly from his own things. 
the only thing that Avram did, you know, is it's true that when he won the wars, they, it became his. But in the beginning, it was not. This is a valid point. This is a valid point, which the Rebbe brings up. So here, here, uh, I'll, I'll get back to that point in a moment. <clears throat> here is the Rebbe's interpretation of this matter. <clears throat> Continuing on from what the Kess of Mishnah says, that it was the tithe of the booty rather than the tithe of the grain. So we know that what the patriarchs did was symbolic Whatever the Torah told, told us that they did was symbolic of their own unique way of serving Hashem. Avraham went around convincing people about monotheism. That was his raison d'etre, as they say. The whole, uh, he, he made it his life's mission and goal to teach people about Hashem. Wherever he went, he would tell people about Hashem. Yitzchak was a much more sheltered, cloistered person. We don't find him doing the same kind of outreach that, Yitz, that Avram did. The Torah talks about him digging wells. And then, of course, we have Yaakov, who uh, brought up a wonderful family, even in the uh, darkest of uh, situations with his father-in-law, who was a big troublemaker, and so on. So, the way we understand this from a Kabbalistic perspective is that Avram symbolized the concept of serving Hashem with chesed, with kindness. And Yitzchak symbolized serving Hashem with gevura, which means strength and more strictness. And that's why Avram's path, Avram's style was always towards kindness and helping people, like we see from the fact that he spread monotheism, like we see from the fact that he gave the meal to the guests, as we're going to learn at the beginning of next week's Parsha, like we see also in next week's Parsha where he prays for the cities of Sodom and Amorah, such wicked people, nevertheless, he prays for them, works so hard so that they could, um, you know, survive. In fact, they don't, but he works on it and so on. He never gives up. So, so that's emblematic of his path in serving Hashem. Yitzchak, on the other hand, we don't have so much about him. There's only one Torah portion about him, which is told us. And, but one thing we find about him is that he was digging wells. And that symbolizes his path in serving Hashem. His path was to develop the good that was already present. That's like you dig a well, you find the water that's already inside that ground, that earth. So Avram was more like bringing change to the world. And Yitzhak was more about developing the traits and the goodness that people already had. Yes, Yisrael, please. Yes, uh, my, my question is, uh... What could could we attribute uh, Abra, Abraham's uh, kindness to his sending away uh, Hagar and Yishmael, uh just because he was urged to do so by his uh, wife? So the fact yeah. that Abraham sent away Hagar and Yishmael was something very counterintuitive, it's totally not his style. And in fact, that's why he hesitated to do it. And he only did it when Hashem told him to do it. Sarah recognized that it had to be done because of the bad influence Yishmael was having on Yitzchak. Still, Avram didn't listen. Like, uh, you know, husbands sometimes don't listen to their wives. They think they know better. Along came Hashem and said, no, no, whatever Sarah tells you, you listen. She knows. She had a power of prophecy that was even better than Avram. 
we see that from this verse so but that's that's true it was it was really against his nature he did it because Hashem told him to and that, and that was a test for him to send away his own son and his own she wasn't a full wife but she was a concubine some kind of wife to send them away was really difficult for him but he did it because Hashem said and and that's what had to be done sometimes even a kind person has to you know be strict and tough thank you rabbi sure so how does this all relate to the tithes that Yitzchak gave versus the tithe that Avram gave and this is going to tie in with what uh, Rabbi Ezra was saying earlier so the tithe that Yitzchak gave was from the natural stuff that he grew he grew in a field and he estimated it, like we said, and he gave 10%. Now, when you take 10% from your field, or nowadays most of us don't have fields, you do it from your income and whatever, what you're saying is a very powerful thing. What you're saying is, you know, everything here that I made, even though I put so much work into it, I plowed, and I planted, and I watered, and I harvested, and I winnowed, and I whatever else. It's really not mine. It really belongs to Hashem. Because what I did was such a small portion compared to what Hashem did. Hashem made it grow. <laughs> you can plant seeds, but if they don't sprout and they don't grow, nothing happens. You just wasted your seeds. And if it doesn't rain, and if there's no sun, and if the whole system that Hashem created doesn't work, then nothing's going to happen. And in fact, who gave me the strength to plow and to plant and the wisdom and so on and so forth, and the land itself, who gave that to me? That's, that's all from Hashem. So when I'm giving 10%, really what I'm saying is, you know, this is really Hashem's. Hashem is kind enough, and He's letting me keep 90%. But the 10% that I'm giving symbolically acknowledges that it's all Hashem's. This is something good to think about, by the way, when, a, when your Yitzhahara maybe says to you, 10%, that's so much. Yeah, 5% is also good, or whatever. Here's the attitude. The attitude is, it's all Hashem's. It's 100% Hashem's. I, if I could, I would give it all back to Hashem. But no, Hashem wants me to keep 90%. He wants me to feed myself and my family and whatever it is. But by giving the 10%, I'm symbolically saying that it's all really Hashem's. And this was really a Yitzchak kind of attitude. Because Yitzchak is about developing the, the truth that's within us the goodness that's within us. It's not so much about changing and making something new. Avram was the trailblazer. He was the one who was bringing monotheism to the masses. They didn't know about it. He was teaching them. He was trying to change them from pagans into believers. Uh, Yitzchak, on the other hand, his whole methodology was to find the goodness, the right beliefs, and so on and so forth that's within every person like the well that has, the, the water that has, sorry, the earth that has water in it already, and dig it, uncover the dirt, take it away and uncover the goodness that's within. So the whole idea of the tithe is not, it's not really saying something new. It's saying, this is the truth. The truth is that it's all Hashem's. I'm just revealing the truth by giving that 10%. Now, Avram also gave 10%. Yes, Abezra. But, but I think that uh, Isaac did that as a recognition that of, of Hashem's kindness to him at the at the Akedah, because it had he knew exactly what was going to happen to him, but Hashem gave him back his life by giving by bringing an an Ail Tahat Yitzhak. and so therefore he in turn. Is showing his his hakata uh, for what Hashem did for him, and so he's doing this 
by giving the 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 tithe. I mean, I I do hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Yitzchak certainly had a a great debt to Hashem. He was uh, he was a second away from death, and uh, and Hashem saved him. That's correct. So he he had a greater awareness of Hashem in his life, perhaps than than most of us uh, did. Yes, I, I hear. So Avram's uh, tithe was of a different nature. The very stuff that Avram was giving the tithe from was almost like a gift from heaven. Every time a person goes to war, you never know who's going to win. You know, Russia and Ukraine. Who would have thought that Ukraine is still where it is, maybe even getting the upper hand. You would think the Russians, they have so much ammunition and manpower and whatnot. But no, you see, it, it doesn't go that way. It doesn't work that way. War is, is very unpredictable. There is a verse in the prophets that talks about this. It's a number 11 in the notes. Number 11 says, Yan, Vayan Melech Israel, Vayomer, Dabru, Al Yishalal Choyger Kemefateach. This is a conversation that the king of Israel, who was none other than Achav at that time, had with the king of Aram, who was none other than Ben Haddad. And Ben Haddad had told Achav that the next day he was planning to come and completely decimate the Jewish people. Let me see if I can find the uh, quote in one of my many windows here that I have open. And I do not see it. Okay, so I'll just have to wing it. But basically, Ben Haddad had said, I'm coming after you. I'm taking all your wealth. I'm taking all your wives. I'm destroying every precious thing that you have. And Achav says to him, let not him who girds on his sword boast like him who ungirds it. You haven't fought the battle yet. Don't show off as if you already won. You may have 10 times the number of forces than I have, but you haven't won the battle yet. And in fact, the next day, the battle was won by the Jewish people, even though they were greatly outnumbered. So the same was true with the Battle of Avram. Avram had 318 men. Some say that it was just him and his servant Eliezer. He fought, according to the Medrash, with dust. He used dust, which turned into arrows. So it was a completely supernatural experience. And of course, after he won the battle, he had to absolutely give thanks to Hashem, no question about it, which he did by giving the 10%. Of course, when a miracle happens to a person, we have to recognize that. We have the whole concept of saying Hagoimel, thanking Hashem if he saves us from a life-threatening situation. There is another bracha that is said specifically if a person experiences a miracle, when he comes back to that place, he says a bracha on the miracle. So we certainly have to recognize Hashem's kindness in performing a miracle for us, which is what Avram did. But the point is that this particular type of tithe giving was more an Avram style type of tithe giving, meaning to say it was changing the uh, awareness of Hashem in the world rather than developing the awareness that was there already. The experience of the war with Avram was showing the world, wow, look at what Hashem can do. Hashem can, 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 uh, can make miracles happen in completely unexpected ways. And of course, this was just the beginning of the many miracles that Hashem showed through Avraham, like we said, with the birth of Yitzhak coming up in next week's parsha was another one. So, and then giving the tithe was, was a recognition of that miracle, but it's all something that's coming from above, trying to change the world. And the idea that the Rambam says that the first person who tithed was Yitzchak is because the Rambam is looking at it from the perspective of the tithe that we have to do on a regular basis, which is from the grain. And that kind of tithe is a Yitzchak tithe. 
that, and that recognizing that the whole world is Hashem's and that we, we know that all along, it's true all the time. We just have to do something and show something to, to bring it to our recognition and to show that it's true, that it is in fact true. So this is a, a um, kind of tithing that relates to Yitzhak, even though both Avram and Yitzhak gave the tithe, but that the style of Avram's tithe giving was different than the style that we give today. Our style of giving is more like Yitzhak, recognizing the truth that Hashem really owns everything all the time in any case, and that is what Yitzhak taught us. Questions? Yes, Reb David. I heard, uh, I think it was Rabbi Gordon on Chabad.org, and he said, a person who's giving uh, tithe, he's thinking, I have to give 10%, I can get by, with, like you said, with 9%, 8%. But if a person was thinking, he's working on commission, because the, the boss owns all the property. So most people that are working on commission, they're 10%, 20%. 50% is amazing. If the boss told you you're on a 90% commission, that's unbelievable. Yes. So that the ways to do it is how you approach the, uh, the, um, the mitzvah. Yes, that's a good one. I like it. Very good. I wish you all a good Shabbos. Thank you, Thank Rabbi. You, Rabbi.